again, I'm I'm Ernest and the, the creator. And one of the one of the things that uh, reason why we uh, were glad to have you is that um, reading your background, I've seen your you know well known photographer uh, who's you know worked for Def Jam several years, um, and it's kind of interesting um, learning about photography and how photography enhances enhances uh, music, especially in the in the eighties. Um, a lot of visuals help tell the story. Um, and from looking at your your um, your background, could you talk to us a little bit, like where you're from, and and a little bit of how you got into uh, photography, and what is it about photography that you think is adds a uniqueness to uh, hip hop and music in general? Well, all right. Well, first, let me just make clear that, you know, I'm not a professional photographer myself. You know, I've worked alongside photographers and I had okay. a photo gallery for a while and on and on like that. But I'm not I'm not a photographer. But as for, you know, the the usefulness of it or the importance of it, um, you know, certainly at the beginning, hip hop was mostly made for the ears. At least rap was made for the ears. OK, uh, there was a period, uh, say, between you know, the first records came out in, in 79 uh, and, and there weren't really very many videos made at all until, I don't know, uh, 82, 83. And, you, you know, it, it, you know, photography is important. It was important for the same reason that, you know, album covers were important, you know. You know, you hear a record on the radio and you love it and you walk around listening to it or drive around listening to it and, you're curious. I think it's a natural reflex to, you know, want to know what do these people look like? And you want to know more than that even, but, you know, photos are, have always been, you know, uh, 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 a swell compliment to uh, the work itself of a recording artist. What's, what's this person look like? So that's all, mm -hmm. you know, and as, my, as for my background, you know, I was, I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up in Detroit. Um, I was, blessed to grow up in Detroit in the 60s. It happened to be a great, great time for American popular music. And it also happened to be a time when radio was very, very integrated in a way that it hadn't been in a, in a, in a way that it also it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it became more segregated, weirdly enough, in the 70s. But in the 60s, you know, it was nothing for me to listen to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and then, you know, Wilson Pickett and uh, Aretha Franklin back to back. And that's just mm -hmm. the way it was then. So, mm -hmm. so what, what sort of captured your, you know, drawn to uh, journalism or uh, photography as an, as an art form? Well, let me, let me say this, because, you know, I, I appreciate that I'm talking to, you know, folks affiliated with the college students and teachers and whatnot. And I, you know, in all fairness, I should say that, you know, I was accepted at the University of Michigan, but that I dropped out after three semesters and I never went back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, you know, that speaks to, you know, you know, my particular uh, psychology, let's say. It also speaks to the times which were kind of tumultuous. But finally, it speaks to, you know, I was starting to find myself, you know, I would have been 19 years old or so. And, um, I, I had a good idea, certainly about what I didn't like at that time, and that mm -hmm. was school. And I also had a pretty good idea about some of the things that I did like. And um, among them were music and reading and writing. And so um, in effect, I was able to assign myself the kind of work, the kind of schoolwork that I wanted to do, mm -hmm. the music I wanted to listen to, the, the, the books I wanted to read. Uh, that kind of thing. And so uh, that's what I did. And I didn't go to school. Also, by the way, I took a job uh, before the first day of class as a, um, as a clerk at the university bookstore, which had a great record department. Okay. And I, held, I held on to that job for uh, the entire time I was in Ann Arbor, six and a half years. And that was formative in a lot of ways too. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about your, your experience with, uh, you know, work, you know, working hand in hand at Def Jam and, um, you know, what, what sense did you get from a lot of artists in the early period in the eighties um, with, you know, groups like uh, Run DMC, LL Cool J, um, what, what kind of sense did you get from them as far as, again, you know, with photography, it, 
it helps tell a story. So what did you get um, from working with them? What was that like? Well, you know, there were some, you, you know, it, my guys were lucky sort of to, to have co to come of age when there were, you know, a little bit more than a handful of good photographers who were working. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, Run DMC come from Hollis, Queens. And uh, there was a, another photographer who, uh, there was a photographer who came out of Hollis. Uh, he was known as uh, Trevor Green at the time. Uh, he's since uh, taken the name Talib Haq, H-A-Q-Q. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and he, um, he was more Russell's age than the, the age of the guys in, in the group, but he was a very good photographer. And he shot the cover for the first album, which came out in 1983. Okay. And to my way of thinking, there's no way of overstating the importance of that cover. Um, because I, as I think about it, the, I don't think the album came out until 84. The first singles came out in 83. So there'd been half a year or more when they, they put out a couple of records that did very, very well. And then finally, the, the album dropped in the spring of 1984. And with an album's worth of music came this wonderful um, cover photo. And all of a sudden, you know, people who would already begun to love Run DMC's music got to look at these guys. And the importance, among other things, was not just, you know, how, you know, what do these young men in particular look like, but also mm -hmm. how are they, how are they dressing? And they, uh, without making any kind of a, uh, uh, an announcement about it, they'd already kind of deviated from the, uh, 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 the style, the, the clothing style of mm -hmm. the rappers who had preceded them. Mm -hmm. you, know, when, you know, when it came to, uh, you know, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, most notably, or the Sugar Hill Gang, or some of the, some of the groups that recorded for the Sugar Hill label, they all... Uh, they were they were dressing kind of in a way in a way that to my way of thinking that was left over. Tell me it's not me. I don't know. Oh, go ahead. All right. So you know the 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 Sugar Hill era artists dressed in a way that to my way of thinking was kind of left over from the funk that preceded it. Okay. And you know you know real particularly you know these guys. Uh, you know, everybody was deeply influenced by George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic. And, you know, so they were going to be brothers from another planet, mostly. That's that's what the idea was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Run DMC just decided they were going to dress like, you know, kind of street hustlers in the hood. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. You know, their particular style was influenced by Jam Master Jay. He had the most style of the three guys in the group. And Jason took his cues from his older brother, who spent a lot of time on the street. And so that's the way they dressed. And, um, you know, the, the, the impact of that photo made a big difference because, you know, among, uh, among other reasons, as I said, because, uh, you know, in effect, they were announcing the start of a new generation of, of rappers right there. Right. Were you, were you able to capture any of the, uh, I guess, like block parties with like, you know, DJ Cool her, you know, Grandmaster Flash capturing, those things where they're actually out in the neighborhood where they're where that you know individuals that live there would could come there and, and and you know connect with the with the artists did you have any experience of that and i like how you mentioned the style of the of the you know 70s you know drew into the to the 80s that's 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 very important but did you experience any of that any of the you know uh, block parties they don't do much of it now but sort of like a festive type thing? Well, uh, the short answer is no. Okay. Um, you know, I didn't, you know, it, it, the thing about hip hop when it began is that it was very, very particular. It started in New York and in the outer boroughs and most notably in the Bronx. And also there was a period of, uh, gee, I don't know, half a dozen years or so, say between 1973 and 1979, when, uh, you know, block parties, uh, were the thing, you know, that's, that's what was happening. Uh, and real particularly, there were no records. And so, okay. you know, um, it was, it was really kind of like a folk music and okay. um, it was so powerful in and of itself that it, it attracted people from, you know, from other parts of the city. And, and certainly by the very early eighties, you had some of the artists uh, who'd started up in the Bronx coming into Manhattan and playing at uh, nightclubs 
downtown in New York and making a lot of friends with people from beyond the borough. But I didn't get to the city until 1980. And, you know, I hadn't been hanging out in the Bronx, you know, for, you know, the through the 70s. And so, um, you know, my introduction to it was, you know, through records, through the, through the very first records, you know, in, in 1979, when the Sugar Hill Gang came out with Rapper's Delight, uh, I was working as the pop music critic for the Boston Herald American, which was a daily mm -hmm. newspaper. And, um, the, you know, um, I, I was listening to, you know, listening to the, you know, a lot of the current music at the time and listening to the radio. And they had one black radio station in the city, radio station WILD. And they started to play this record called uh, Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. Okay. And it was, it really was a remarkable record. Uh, not, you know, and, and nobody was singing, first of all. Uh, second of all, the thing was 15 minutes long, 15 mm -hmm. minutes long. And the mm -hmm. label released it as a single. There was a three minute edit of it. But as soon as kids on the block heard the entire 15 minute version, they memorized every word of it, every second of it. So if, if they're listening to radio at home and the, and the station played the, um, the edited version, these kids would blow up the phones and say, are you kidding? Play the whole damn record. And wow. so that was, that was a phenomenon. That was, you know, to me, that was, that was really astonishing. And then, you know, uh, again, so let's say that's, you know, uh, late summer, early fall, 1979, by the, um, uh, by Christmas of 1979, another very important Chris, uh, a rap record came out. Mm -hmm. It was by this guy named Curtis Blow, and it was called okay. Christmas Rappin', Christmas Rappin'. And, you know, okay. it, was, it was wonderful. It was, you know, probably the first rap Christmas record, but again, the music was so new and it was so compelling, you know, kind of apart from, uh, uh, you know, the form of it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say apart, apart from the subject matter, say that, right? Okay. That it played right through Christmas and very typically, you know, to this day, you know, uh, Christmas records are made for the Christmas season. Right. And you listen to them on the radio or you play them at home uh, during Christmas and come the new year, you put it all aside and you're not listening any, anymore. With Curtis Blow's Christmas Rappin', radio station WILD played that record into February and perhaps even into April. They mm -hmm. could not retire it. Once again, the kids wouldn't let them. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that happened in Boston before I moved to New York. And um, it was, you know, all, you know, impactful to me. Something was happening. I moved to New York, and, and by the fall of 1980, I was freelancing to the New York Daily News, and this guy, Curtis Blow, had another hit. He had a national hit mm -hmm. with a record called The Breaks. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, yeah. you're, not, you're not a young man. I know. <laughs> Go ahead. Ernest. Go ahead. Yeah, but also, yeah. Let me say this. You know what? Okay. This is the advantage of us being older. You know, we live through some. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, anyway, so Kurt had a national hit and I'd been familiar with his first record. And so I went to my editor at the Daily News and I said, listen, this guy happens to be local. This is a local story and a national uh, story at the same time. How about if, if you know, I interview him and, and write about him? And my editor said, go ahead. And so I did. And mm -hmm. You know that that led to a, a number of other things. So, mm -hmm. and so my next question, then I'll give the students a uh, opportunity to ask you questions that they came up with. So, how much did the the movie Crush Movement was you know was a, one of my favorite movies, and that was because you know the local artists at the time, and I remember um, when LL Cool J rock, walks in with his radio, and that I think that captured what hip hop you know was a mechanism not in an art form so do you do you think that that helped elevate music a little bit more meaning you just said that you know hey play the whole record do you think that, that type of movie had a great influence as opposed to you don't see much of that those type of movies now well here's the thing about rap and hip hop it, it was okay. extraordinarily uh, popular right away. And I always think of it by contrast to the, the punk rock movement that preceded it, you know, starting in the, in the mid seventies. And that was something that, you know, it started in America. It was picked up in England. Uh, it, you know, it tried to bounce back to America and it had tremendous kind of critical 
impact. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, uh, music writers wrote about it and other musicians were listening. But in, term, in terms of popularity, nobody bought those records. Nobody. Okay. When Rapper's Delight comes out in the, in the fall of 1979, it's an immediate popular hit and not just in America and not just in England, but it charted on, uh, it, it charted in a dozen other countries. This was a brand new type of music on an independent label, uh, a black owned label, as a matter of fact. And um, it just blew the hell up. And, you know, so wait, what, what was the question again? We were talking about something in particular. In particular. And I was just talking about the, the movie Crush Groove and like, oh, Crush did, Groove. It, did it add a, did it add sort of a, a different validity or spin on of course the helping the artist yes that, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I'm... of course you know the thing about the, the thing about crush group let me you know take a second and just say you sure. know among among other things you know even well before the movie here's how here's how the movie started a writer for the wall street journal decided decided to to do a feature story about our little uh our little business about Russell Simmons and, and Rush Productions and Def Jam, because we'd released, you know, I don't know, you know, like three singles by then, but we were starting to make a stir. And so this story appears in the Wall Street Journal and not one, but two different Hollywood producers saw it and said, huh, there's a movie here. Now they were thinking about it in, you know, kind of the most typical uh, kind of restrictive Hollywood way, which is, you know, this rap stuff is going to be like the twist it's a fad and it'll be over in a few months. And so if we're going to make some money from it, we ought to get something done right away. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, it's goofy and it's narrow minded and, 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 and even so, okay. So they're going to put some resources at risk. And we started to make the movie in February of 84 and it was in theaters by April of 84. And um, it was, you know, kind of remarkable because, you know, it's, it's another way of saying, you know, this, music, which was a rumor to most people for a half a dozen years or more, you know, and all of a sudden it starts to come out on records and, and, you know, then wait a minute, you know, in, in the spring of 84, there's a movie about it. There's a whole movie about it. And also by that time, there's all sorts of other stuff happening. You know, mm -hmm. MTV, MTV had started in 1981 and, you know, they, what they were doing was kind of corny. They had a kind of a rock, uh, bias to the programming and, you know, an English rock bias. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ho hum, you know, but all of a sudden here comes, you know, Herbie Hancock, the great jazz pianist and band leader. Right. And, and, you know, he, he hooks up with, um, Oh shoot. I'm trying to, Oh, Bill Laswell, who's a New York based producer who's messing with these um, you know, he's, he's older than rap, but he's got rap oriented friends. Mm -hmm. And so he convinces Herb to make a rap record with some of these hip hoppers. And it was called Beat It. No, it wasn't. It was called, you know what? Somebody who's you know got a, a cell phone, look up, look up the name of, of uh, Herbie Hancock. Oh, it's called Rocket. That's what Rocket, it's called. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. All right, so he put out a record called Rocket and they made a great video in London, okay? And, the combination of the music, which was fresh as hell, and this wonderful video, um, you know, it barnstormed uh, MTV, and it opened the door for the stuff that came later. So that, um, you know, so that that was 83. By 84, here comes Run DMC, their second single, they made a video of it. It was called Rock Box. Mm -hmm. And again, MTV couldn't leave it alone. Who the hell will run DMC? What kind of music were they, are they making? But something about it was so powerful mm -hmm. that this, this brand new national cable network couldn't leave it alone. And this is at a time, let's, you know, it, it was useful to think of, of, uh, of MTV as a kind of a national video version of the rock radio stations that were, you know, a thing at the time. And what, what that meant is that none of those radio stations played artists of color period. They just mm -hmm. didn't. Because whatever it was a Black artist was doing, it didn't qualify as rock and roll. That was something that white people did, right? Right. And, and, and uh, MTV, you know, was following that model. And then all of a sudden, first Herbie Hancock, then Run, Run DMC, you know, then LL, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, 84, 85, when his first singles and, and video starts to come out. And, you know, on and on and on. The impact of this stuff was gigantic right away and it and 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 huge in a variety of different media too 
So mm -hmm. go ahead, Viola. I know you have got some questions that you've written down, but feel free, feel free to ask Bill. Hi. Hey. Um, one of my questions was since you pretty much witnessed like rap history as like a pioneer in music journalism, how do you feel about about today's like rap and rap culture and the evolution from then to now? Well, that's 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 a pretty broad question. I mean, you know, uh, I, let me just say that I'm I'm delighted that it's lasted this long and it's taken so many forms. And um, you know, when I when I think about it, I mean, again, one of the things about it is not just what's happened, not just you know the evolution of of rap in America, but um, you know the, its impact globally. So, you know, again, one of the things about it is that it, it's first so popular and then so flexible that people all over the world started to record this new music in their own language, whatever it happened to be. And that's something that continues. And it's something that I think is, is, is very positive. And I think, you know, the political impact of the music is, is hard to be overstated. I mean, just in terms of, um, you know, making Black folks more... Uh, visible in America, you know, and, and, you know, there was a guy who was uh, partnered up with, with Sean Combs, AKA Puff Daddy. And uh, his name is Steve Stout. And he wrote a book at this point is 10 years ago or more called the tanning of America. Well, that's a process that was put into place. A new wave of it was put into place with rap and hip hop. So all of that's to the good. Now, having said all of that, you know, and also, you know, the style impact, the fashion impact of this stuff is is astonishing and it continues. But, you know, um, in terms of, you know, I don't I don't know how politically it might be. And I don't know if you, you know, in effect, you're asking about the politics of the music and perhaps, you know, you know, the the the, the sexism of the music or the homophobia of it or, you know, the, the money mindedness of it. Is any of that of interest to you? It could be. I'm all for that. Um, I, I was fit, like asking, like, as far as like to, today's state of rap, like how you felt about the artists of today and the culture of today around rap. Listen, I got, I got to tell you, you know, it's it's not like I, I I don't pretend really to keep up. I'm not fiendish about it. You know, everything that just used to land in my lap, and so it was unavoidable. But you know, I haven't you know worked for a record label for for decades now. You know, there was a period I've got. You know, my my son is. 31 years old now, you know, starting when he's a teenager, he's going to turn me on to the stuff that he was listening to at that moment. So, you know, I, I got to be, uh, you know, I was exposed to uh, music that I might not have heard very much at the time. You know, would I have paid very much attention to Little John if my son wasn't, you know, pulling my coat sleeve? I don't know, but he did, and I'm grateful. And, you know, some things break through to me, you know, uh, Megan the Stallion kills me, Car Cardi B always kills me. Um, but um, I'm not, um, I'm really, really not even close to an expert on, on you know, contemporary rap. I, you know, I'm, I'm just glad that, you know, things still happen in its name. And also what occurs to me is that um, there's a tremendous amount of stylistic variety in it, you know, that there are, you know, there are uh, uh, huge stars, uh, you know, still operating as rappers, um, but, in, and maybe all of them, you know, more or less adhere to a kind of a mainstream, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, it, it takes a variety of forms and it's a variety of different voices and uh, a, a, a variety of different perspectives. And again, that's all to the credit of, um, you know, the music, the, the, the music that it continues to grow, that it's not, um, it doesn't hem in an artist or anybody who wants to have anything to do, you know, with it. You know, who, anybody who wants to make something in the name of hip hop is basically free to go ahead. Do you, and good luck to you. And, you know, likewise, you know, I mean, I think part of the popularity, part of the reason for the popular, popularity of it is that it is so broad and it does allow so many uh, uh, different kind of folks to identify with it. Is that an answer? <laughs> yes, thank you. All right. Ms. Smith, you got a question? Yeah, I have a question. So um, when I was doing research, and you mentioned this before, um, it's, it was stated that you grew up in New York, Michigan, and Detroit. So 
moving from those different states, do you think that helped you shape your interest in hip hop journalism? Journalism, and then my other question is, with your um, I Jimmy hip hop collection, did you choose to shoot in black and white to portray a message, or was that just something you thought would benefit like pe- viewers to um you know be connected to it? Well, look, can, would you remind me of the second question, then I'll answer the first question first, okay? You know, yeah. let, let, let me answer that one. So, you know, it's, it's you know, basically, it, were you saying, you know, you're, you're wondering if where I grew up helped spur my interest in journalism or, or hip-hop journalism? Is that the question? Yeah, I think it's hip-hop journalism. Yeah. All right, well, look, you know, I'm older than hip-hop, and I started writing about music uh, before hip hop, you know, I started writing for publication in, you know, 1973. And at the time I'm in Ann Arbor and it's a kind of a, a little hippie bastion. And there was a so-called underground newspaper. And, you know, if you don't know what an underground newspaper was, you can look it up that that was the thing at the time. And, um, uh, you know, I wrote about, you know, the things that were interesting to me at the time, you know, and, and you know, that was a variety of music. I'll, I'll say this, you know, my interest in, in journalism followed my interest in music that's really the my my love of music is really uh the defining characteristic of my life it's a lifelong thing i remember fa- my father singing me to sleep when i still took naps as a you know whatever a four-year-old and you know i listened to a lot of music as i said i grew up in detroit you know during this this period that was magnificent and you know i i didn't have anything to compare it to it wasn't until i left detroit um, and moved to Boston, w- about which I knew nothing, that I understood, you know, how blessed I'd been to grow up in, in Detroit, which, which was a great, great city for music. I feel that way. I think I was better off growing up in Detroit than in New York. I was exposed to more music. And, um, uh, you know, then I go away to school, and I start to work in a record store, and I drop out of school, but I could still go work at the college radio station. And so that's another way of expressing my love of music. And then that led to um, the opportunity to write about music. And so it was just kind of one thing after another. You know, it, there, was, there was hardly ever a time when I thought to myself, oh, I want to grow up and be a music journalist. Um, it's just, you know, as I said, the only constant thing was I love, I love music and I want to learn more about it. And these opportunities to express my love uh, you know, in effect, just appeared. And, and I, I would dip my toe in and see how it worked. And one thing, you know, has led to another. There was never a period when I thought to myself, oh, you know, I'm going to run a music-oriented art gallery, you know, when I grow up. I, you know, it was just uh, a possibility that presented itself, you know, when I was already over 50 years old. And I said, oh, you know, nobody else is doing, that's another thing. I'll tell you one thing that's been helpful to me is that uh, a lot of times I'll try so, something that is uh, relatively rare. And it's, it's like when I went to work at Def Jam, you know, and, and um, you know, Russell, Russell hired me, but, you know, as brilliant as he was, you know, he wasn't a great uh, organizer of, of a business. And so he just said, why don't you come work with me? And so I did. And I was on the job for maybe two weeks. And I realized that he didn't have anybody, he didn't have a publicist working with him. (laughs) And so I told myself, um, I haven't done it before, but I know I can do better than nothing. There's nothing (laughs) going on. He's not doing it. I can do better than nothing. And then I told Ross and he said, well, go ahead and give it a try. Right. And so, again, that goes to show kind of how random uh, my so-called career has been. But what unifies it all is this, you know, uh, uh, lifelong love of music. Now, the next question is about photography again and shooting in black and white. Was that it? Yeah. So um, with the iGemmy collection, I noticed that it was a lot of um photos and black and white film so did you choose to shoot with black and white film to portray a message and then um or was that the only option at the time no no there was such a thing as color photography earlier okay. than that. but let me let me say how old are you bill 
Um, no, there was color photography going back to, you know, the 40s or so. I think that's really when it started. But um, uh, first of all, let me say again, I am not a photographer. You know, it so happens I've got a couple of pictures in that collection, but mostly, you know, that collection is, uh, you know, comprises the work of 60 different photographers who worked over the period uh, mm -hmm. that I was, I was running the gallery, you know, we're, you know, through that period. And I'm not so sure... Oh, I'm not sure why any of them would choose black and white. I, I, I don't know about personally why any of them would do it, but um, I know why I've done it sometimes. There's something about it. You know, it seems antique, you know, um, and yet there's, there's, there's something about the appeal of black and white photography. It's, it's got its own kind of beauty. And, um, you know, so I've shot some black and white and a lot of these photographers you know, uh, chose to shoot in black and white, you know, and, and I think of, um, what the hell was I going to say? Ernest, are you going to, you're going to edit, aren't you? Tell me you're going to, yeah. a little bit, so if you've got yeah. me, you know, yeah. scratch my head and wondering what the hell I'm going to say next, you'll, you'll lose that. Okay, good. So um, I was going to say something about, something again about uh, black and white. It's just, um, it, it links to uh, the whole history of photography prior to that moment, um, because you know there was uh, nothing but black and white photography from the beginning of photography, which is you know whatever the 1830s or the 1840s, and then finally a hundred years later, I think in the 1940s, you start to see you start to have the option of color photography, um, and both of them have their own appeal, but. Yeah, a lot of the photographers I was working with then um, uh, chose to shoot in black and white, not always exclusively, but a lot. And, you know, come to think of it, you know, um, when the collection ended up in the hands of the Smithsonian, uh, the, the photo curator who bought it, Rhea Combs, okay. woman's name is Rhea Combs, okay? okay. And so the, the first, you know, Rhea, Rhea, uh, Rhea purchased my collection on behalf of the, the museum. And then she pretty quickly curated a show and the show was fairly remarkable. You know, it, it, it was really, it's the kind of thing that a hip hop era person would do, a hip hop era photo lover would do. Um, she decided to take uh, photos from my collection and pair up uh, the ones that she'd chosen with a, a photo from their larger collection. And the idea was to kind of make a connection between you know, this, this, this kind of brand new contemporary culture with what had preceded it, you know, uh, within African-American life and African-American history. And again, I think, you know, the idea was, um, you know, to show that as new and as kind of edgy as hip hop was to some people, you know, it was easy to make a, connect, a connection between what was going on in the hip hop era and what had preceded it in various other Af uh, er eras of African-American life. And she did that deliberately. And, and, and the, um, uh, a lot of the image, you know, uh, all of the images in my collection are, are not in black and white, but I think Rhea chose all black and white for the, uh, the show she put together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, I went to the, uh, the museum in DC uh, and I was kind of taken back about all the hip hop you know, like Jay Diller, he's got a lot of the artifacts in there, but, um, you know, how was that process of uh, donating your collection to there and then donate, donating your, quest, your collection to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is it? Uh, Cornell? Cornell, yeah. Um, so what, what was that like? I mean, it's, it's those artifacts, sometimes they're hard to um, to give up because they're, you know, they're so priceless. So what, you know, how, how was that for you to relinquish? Those I, don't, I, don't think, I really don't think of it that way. It's not like I collected this stuff, you know, come on, Ernest. I, I, I you don't, you're a collector. Do you collect yeah. because, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to build a trust fund out of it or something? No, you know, no. Money? Yeah. You're you right. The, you do it for the sake of history and for the sake of culture. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I did it. I started to build that kind of stuff, those kind of, um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, a funny term, but I discovered uh, um, when I started working at the, uh, the Herald in Boston, 
it was a, you know, a, a daily newspaper and it had been in place for a long time. And they had a library on the premises and it was a, a library of newspaper clippings organized by subject. And they called it a morgue. That's known as a newspaper morgue. And um, the writers and editors use the, the information in those files for research purposes. And I'd already begun to do that kind of thing for myself as a writer. You know, when I first started writing, um, uh, I was particularly drawn to the music of uh, African-American artists. And, you know, it would be, you know, not so hard, probably too easy, just, you know, to listen to the new record and go to a show and write about what I saw and I heard, but I wanted to dive a little deeper and I was looking for, um, you know, smart reference books. And there mm. weren't a ton at that time. This would have been circa 1973. Mm. So at that time, I started to collect smart articles, newspaper and magazine articles I saw about the artists that I cared. And I did it for myself. I wasn't sure. thinking about any damn body but me. What mm -hmm. do I need to have reference to so that I don't, appear, I don't appear to be an ignoramus when I have to put pen to paper? Right. And so, you know, I continue to do it when I go to work at Rush. You know, when I start working for Russell, you know, I had files on a bunch of his artists. You think he'd kept any of the articles written about Curtis Blow? He didn't have anything, you know, he didn't have anything like it. Mm -hmm. And it turned, it turns out. So, you know, once I'm, uh, you know, sitting there, you know, I, 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 I not only collected stuff written about my guys, but I was able to write stuff myself. You know, every press release, every bio that I wrote, every photo that I commissioned, believe me, I held on to it. And after just a couple of years, what I discovered was uh, other writers, critics, documentary film editors, on and on, um, started to come to me because I had a collection of this stuff mm -hmm. and, it, mm -hmm. and it was useful because the typical thing, Ernest, again, you'll know about this as a collector, is that the vast majority of cultural production in human history disappears. That's why they talk about the scrap heap of history. What's on the scrap heap of history? You know, you can say, well, that's, that's where, you know, uh, defunct ideas go. Guess what? That's where cultural products go as well. Mm -hmm. Very, very little survives, okay? And so, you know, as somebody who, who feels that, you know, I'm somebody who believes, you know, there's an old saying about how journalism is the first rough draft of history. So as somebody who's interested in history, I also care about journalism. And I hold on to that stuff because I don't want that first draft lost. And, and, and as I said, you know, it's been tremendously gratifying to me that uh, my instincts on this, my selfish instincts, let me, let me just try to be a little smarter myself, that, you know, first, uh, well before, you know, the internet, you know, I could share the materials in these files in my own morgue with other writers and with documentarians and whatnot. And then, you know, I gave a speech at, um, oh, geez, um, the Schomburg Museum yeah, yeah. In, in, in Harlem, uh, which is devoted to black culture. And, um, it, you know, I, I can't even remember how, you know, kind of how and why they asked me about it. You know, it's not like a lot of people knew about my collections then. But uh, they invited me to talk about my collections. And Catherine Reagan from Cornell University was just there just to, to listen to what people had to say. And she came up to me in the wake of it and said, hey, we're interested in your collection. And so one thing led to another. And that's how my collection you know, of, of newspaper, you know, wrap newspaper clippings and those kind of materials ended up at Cornell. And, and, and as for uh, you know, how the collection ended up at um, uh, the Smithsonian, that was, you know, also fairly random. You know, I had a friend who uh, had put together an exhibit of um, album covers, maybe, you know, album covers and posters and whatnot at a, a, a small gallery in Harlem. And uh, the, the, he invited me to talk. I, it was called From Motown to Def Jam. And so um, you know, I could talk about the Def Jam stuff. And so he pulled me in. And in the wake of it, this is so random friends, I just want you to know, but this is how it works sometimes, okay? My son came to, you know, hear his dad run his mouth. And when, when we were done talking about the exhibit, he raised his hand and he said, uh, 
maybe he said, Mr. Adler, Mr. Adler, would you tell us about your hip hop collections? And I, you know, even at that moment, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, what does this have to do with what we were just talking about? But I, I did talk a little bit about my collections, including my, my hip hop photography collection. And sure enough, somebody comes after me afterwards and says, you know, they're opening up an African-American museum in DC next year. And I believe the photo curator would be interested in what you've done. And so I followed up with it. And sure enough, that's what happened. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. Um, even me as a historian, but as a you know collector, you know, I look for artifacts. I have been more diligent in looking at vinyl just because even the interns, they, you know, they when they, you know, work with us, they're fascinated. But also they, you know, they understand a lot about you know the music, the culture, uh, and what it adds. I remember back in two thousand eleven, I produced a play. It was called "For the Love of Hip Hop," and so mm. what I I created a story between a young man and a and a girl, you know, who he grew up with, and they he fall he kind of fell out of love with hip hop, and he was he was very angry, but she was trying to you know tell him that hey, you know how you know, New York was the mecca for hip hop. And he basically becomes a, he, bec he becomes a teacher. And now he's able to teach and go through the period. So in the play, I kind of created those periods like uh, KRS-One, um, Run DMC. But um, what was interesting is I got an old school boom box. And when the when parents were there and he walked in the, he walked in the classroom with his boom box and set it on the table. And I mean, the, the kids just went, you know, they just went nuts because now they're looking at the actual, you know, artifact. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that where we are now, I'm hoping to, uh, you know, recreate that play and add certain periods of hip hop in there to help tell a more visual story with, with artifacts. And so what you've given us today is just, those artifacts are just so valuable. I mean, again, when I go and look at album covers, I, I look at the co covers first, and then I might pull out my phone and say, and then I find out that, hey, this song was sampled or, you know, and I found all kind of um, interesting stuff. And so um, we appreciate you uh, taking time with us. I think Yasmin has at least two questions to ask you before we, um, before we get off. All right. Well, listen, you know, no big rush. I'm having fun. I hope you are too. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, yeah, we weren't going to hold you too long. I had some photos, but I'm not able to share my screen because I'm online, but um, let's see something fun. Oh, I just wanted to say though, I listening to what you were saying about being a journalist as I've been a print newspaper journalist for almost 15 years now. A lot of people think like newspaper, what? Like, yes, I love it. So I've been doing that. And I definitely get the, I understand what you were saying between your, what you're passionate about, such as writing and journalism and what you, uh, you know, have a talent in this, this, uh, the hip hop and enjoying music and things like that. So that's where it just merges for me. And so I'm so excited. I wish we had time to hear more of your stories, but I want to know, um, What's a song that, a hip hop song that you, every time you hear it, it takes you back to that time working with Def Jam or, or writing about 30 years of hip hop. Do you have a certain song every time you hear it? Gee, I don't know. There's, there's so much of it, you know. <laughs> um, you know, the, I, I, I've always been a big fan of uh, It's Tricky by Run DMC. I've always been a huge fan of uh, "Bring the Noise" by Public Enemy. Oh man! Uh, and not and not just PE's version of it, but the version of it that was done by this heavy metal band called Anthrax. Does anybody know about that? Raise your hand yeah. if you know about the version of Anthrax, please. Okay. <laughs> Ladies, don't play. Please look it up. Okay, and and it's because you know again it speaks to you know the 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 barrier crossing appeal of this music, okay? The band Anthrax is some, you know, garden variety white guys from New Jersey, okay? But they were listening to this rap stuff and they were moved by it and Public, public Enemy came out and it ruined them. And they wanted, and, and they basically, they made their own version of Bring the Noise and 
it includes uh, actually with this is a, a, a good little story so they wanted to cut new vocals with with chuck and flavor and you know it, it didn't happen and i won't even go into why it didn't happen it's not because the guys didn't want to do it but um you, you know the the uh, this goes back to records uh, the record itself included vocal versions, extended versions, et cetera, et cetera, and a version that had two verses of acapella vocals on it, right? Oh, and so when the guys in Anthrax couldn't get Chuck to come into the studio. They just swapped in the, the pre-recorded acapella vocals and put it on their version. And then, um, you know, I, I heard it. I happened to have moved on from Def Jam then and, I, and then, and I was working at Island Records for a year before I got fired, by the way. Um, I just want you to know it hasn't all <laughs> just been, you know, one success after another. I've quit jobs. I've been fired from jobs. Anyway, so there, I'm just there. And it turns out that Anthrax recorded for Island and we're sitting at a meeting one day and they play this new, this new version of, of Bring the Noise and it blew the top of my head off. And, you know, so, you know, the guy working with him at the label said, um, you know, the manager and the band want to do a video with Public Enemy. Uh -huh. but they have no idea how to get to him. I said, please let me help you. And so I was able to, to put them all together. And we went to Chicago and, um, you know, shot the video for um, this, this song, this version by Anthrax of, of Public Enemy's Bring the Noise. And it was a giant hit. And you was talking about MTV, um, you know, and how MTV started to pick up, you know, you know, early hip hop, you know, and, uh, you know, I can remember, you know, wa watching, you know, Run DMC and some of those early groups and then Fab Five Freddy and, and uh, you know, Ed Lover. I mean, it just added a different dynamic. Um, I think MTV, you know, needed they needed that they needed hip-hop i mean it made it you know it made it explode and so i mean video soul video music box um much of that because of i think just because of technology um much of that is lost but i think it's still there and so hopefully you know there's a resurgence there's a resurgence of that um just on you know the conversation we had today um you know people I, again, hip hop is not dead. It's just, it's just changing. Um, but um, you know, journalism is still, uh, you know, a big thing. You know, the uh, putting writing things in magazines. Um, you know, me myself, Bill, I was kind of doing running everything uh, until you know Yasmin came about, and you know, it seems like when when she took over the you know doing the publisher stuff. You know, it, it put me in the right direction so I can identify with, you know, trying to organize yourself. And I think that uh, sometimes, you know, you get caught up in so much of the entertainment, you know, the business side is 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 kind of left left behind. But certainly uh, what you've done, I mean, I'm I'm just amazed of, of your stories. And I did, you know, look at some of your, you know, your art pieces and your ph photography. Um, and then if you go to the you know, the museum in DC, I mean, they've got, you know, Jay Dillers, uh, 808 and, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of times these the kids, especially in middle school, you know, they don't even know what vinyl is, but they know what an MP3 player is. But I think that vinyl is making its way back. That's why I continue to, you know, collect tons of records. Well, you know, listen, uh, I, I do believe that that vinyl is is uh, having a second life, and and you know that's that's gratifying, obviously. But mm -hmm. you know, I want to say there are a couple of things that occur to me, and one is this: you know, um, part of the strength of hip hop is that it's managed to thrive locally, in God knows how many hundreds of communities right here in America, and I don't know the extent to which you're collecting locally, but mm -hmm you know, you should definitely do it. Yeah. You know, um, it, it would be a point of pride for everybody local. And also, you you know, to the extent that you're, you're maybe not doing it wholeheartedly yet, I'll bet you, you know, there are collectors in the community that would, you know, besides you, who would, you know, surprise you with what they've already collected, you know, about that speaks to what's happened in the name of hip hop locally mm -hmm. over the course of the last 
30 odd years. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and you'd be doing something unique. I mean, not to say that you aren't already, for you to be teaching it at the university level, you know, who would have dreamt of such a thing, you know, in the, er in the early days, this stuff was so uh, street oriented. What do you mean? You know, sometime in the early 2000s, Harvard University is going to start a department of hip hop? Yeah. It's a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right. I mean, I taught uh, hip, hip hop and soul music um, this past uh, two weeks at Bennett College, and it was it was such a great class. I mean, we, we got into the nuts and bolts of it. And, and I find out from students that they you know, they, they know a lot and they try to take it all in. Um, and we have discussions about it. It's not like, you know, I'll talk with the students instead of talking at them. And that's what, uh, that's just what's, what's unique. But to suggest now that it's being done at Harvard, it's probably doing at Chapel Hill and, and all these schools. But my, my biggest question would be is, you know, is there really a vested interest in it or, you, or is it just going to be part of the curriculum? Um, I, so I see it in kind of uh, two, two folds that, you know, sometimes the people um, who live through the culture, know about the culture, are the greatest teachers. And to some well, degree. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the most invested in it. But again, you know, it, it, it's, it's sort of chicken and egg, you know, so yeah. uh, our friends, um, I'm, I'm friends with a guy named Keith Harrison, okay. who works at the, you know, he's a, a professor at the University of Central Florida, and he's put together a program, and I feel like an idiot, I should be able to tell you exactly what the name of the program is, but basically he himself is a, a hip hop lover, who was also a jock when he was younger. And he's business oriented. And so he's put together a program that somehow manages to intertwine hip hop and sports and business. Mm -hmm. And he's the whole curriculum devoted to that. And mm -hmm. that speaks to his personal interest. And, and uh, among other things, it speaks real particularly to his interest uh, to educate and to be a teacher. And mm -hmm. it just so happens he wants to teach uh, subjects about which he's passionate. Now, I'm not saying that that's unusual, you know, because, you know, let's say you wanted to teach Greek you know, uh, ancient Greek uh, at the university level. Well, you know, there's there's obviously a surviving literature uh, about it. And, you know, an individual can still be moved by what's written and the art that survives and all the rest of that stuff. But, you know, uh, it, there's, there's no uh, less a reason mm. to be smitten by what's contemporary and to want to teach about that. And, and I'm saying, you know, vis-a-vis -vis hip hop, uh, it seems like that's happening now. Yeah. And one last question. Did you, I mean, the Fat Boys is one of my favorite groups. Did you ever, you know, run across them and work with them? Oh, sure. In their capacity, because they, they made, you know, to me, they're pioneers. They made great music, music too. I agree. I loved them. Uh, you know, again, one of the things about hip hop and, and you know, a measure of its you know, kind of astonishing popularity from the very beginning was that as of the fall of 1984, um, our guys went out on the road with uh, the first Swatch Watch rap festival. And Swatch was a Swiss watch company. Swatch, I guess, is a, a mushing together of Swiss watches. All of a sudden, it's Swatch. Okay. And um, it's because... You know, they sponsored the show because um, the Fat Boys were managed by a guy, Charlie Stetler, and mm -hmm. Charlie happened to be from Switzerland. And so he had connections there and he was involved with these hip hoppers and he, he persuaded the Swiss company to back an American tour. But, you know, as of, uh, so that's as of the fall of 84. So that's, you know, Run DMC at the top of the bill and the Fat Boys. And LL Cool J and Houdini, I think. Maybe LL yeah. wasn't even on the bill. Houdini was on the bill. Mm -hmm. And the point of it was, we played arenas from the very beginning, 10,000 to 15,000 seats. That's the fall of 1984. It's early. And, you know, the, the equivalent thing, you know, a, a punk, a, the punk rock era was, um, you know, um, anybody here of Henry Rollins, you know, the punk rock guy, Henry Rollins? Nobody knows. I never, that's, all. I never. that's all right. I'm just saying he wrote a, a memoir and it was called Get in the Van, Get in mm. the Van. 
because that described his life. They were going to move from one small nightclub to another. He played a 30, 30 kids one night and 70 the next night, et cetera, et cetera. That's how, you know, that's, that's literally the measure of how popular the music was at the time. By contrast, our guys are playing to tens of thousands of people right at the beginning. Wow. And the oh, Fat Boys were great. You know, they were, they were very, you know, they were, they were down to earth, as you might imagine. Uh -huh. You know, good guys. Yeah. They, yeah. Well, we certainly uh, want to thank you for joining us today. Um, again, it, I've got a lot out of it. Hopefully uh, we can, you know, keep trying to connect. Um, we're, we're constantly um, trying to, you know, interview, you know, artists and, you know, other individuals that um, know a lot about the culture because I think that it's, it's vital and necessary um, from collecting to curating, uh, you know, to the different types of uh, music. You know, I've grown myself in, you know, the last few years as far as, you know, the diversity of music. I, I mean, I listened to rock and roll first before I even listened to, you know, hip hop, you know, ZZ Tops, uh, Megadeth. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I love Eddie Van Halen. I was a big Van Halen fan. Um, Minute Work. Uh, well, so, was Michael, so was Michael Jackson. Let's yeah. not forget. Yeah, Michael Jackson, Sammy Hagar. Um, yeah, the, the, the list goes on. Kids, I listen to kids. Um, and, and again, you know, music, music is music, you know, from my understanding. But um, thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, oh, no, no. You can't cut me off. You got me too excited. Let me say one Okay, last go ahead. <laughs> along these, along these okay. lines, okay? You know, I do believe this is some hippie stuff, so you can, you know, take it or leave it. But I okay. think who tends to believe, we used to say everything connects. Everything okay. connects. That's if you're if you're paying attention. Okay. You know, there's a really connection. And certainly it's true. That's how musicians listen, musicians think, musicians create. You know, they don't live in a little bubble. You know, they're, they're listening to what, you know, everybody else is doing and has done. And they stitch together something that they hope that they can call their own. And very, very frequently, you know, uh, whatever it is that they love is going to cross, you know, whatever kind of narrow uh, identity markers define yeah. them. You know, you know, just because, you know, you, you know, you're you're white. You know, you can't listen to music made by black musicians. Ridiculous. And the, right. and the, reverse, is, and the review, reverse as well uh, is true as well. Mm -hmm. And having said all of that, one last point along the same lines. The, you know, you talk about, you know, kind of the challenge of playing older music for, for young kids today. Um, what I find over and over again, it's really, really gratifying, is that, um, you know, if, if certainly if, the, if, the, if a, a given piece of music is relatively well recorded and it's been digitized and you can you can hear it now that way um it often communicates despite the fact that it might be very very old i mean let's put aside you know everybody's love for so-called classical music which you know you know the, the heart of that that's that's all music made in the 17 and the 1800s for the most part okay, okay? Right. You, go to concert, you listen to that stuff and you know if it's played a certain way and you're you're bent in that way you're going to love it and you're going to be moved by it but my situation is you know uh at the same time that i'm i'm you know being turned down to new music all the time as a record collector uh, i'm turned down to older music all the time so in recent years not only am i buying 33s and 45s but i started buying 78s mm -hmm. you know about 78 rpm records everybody <laughs> no, it was about a 78. Okay. Well, that's because, you know, before records were uh, uh, LPs, they were the, you know, there was a period between the 1920s and the 1950s when records were pressed, not on vinyl, but on shellac. And they, they revolved at 78 RPMs per minute, not 33, mm -hmm. not 45. And a lot of that stuff did not make it into the 33 era, into the digital era, et cetera, et cetera. That you go back and you, you, you knock the dust off it and you put the needle down. And, you know, so what if it was recorded 80 years ago? It's still, you know, it still really might move you. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised when that happens. Right. Yeah. But again, thank, thank you. Um, we'll go and stay in touch. Uh, like I said, it gave us a you know wealth of information. 
Um, mm -hmm. The interns got uh, wealthy. You guys got any last questions to ask Bill before we leave? Um, I had a question just really quick. I, I read that you helped found a um, spoken word label. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, what is either like a spoken word poet or maybe um, a specific piece that you, is it your, your favorite? Gee, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I feel, I feel a little bit dumb. Let me just say this, you know, it's, uh, spoken word is, you know, it's, it's, it's poetry performed vocally. You know, so, you know, you, you don't want to mystify it. It's poetry. But the, the, the kind of how and why I, I started working on a label was because, you know, there was a, a, a poet friend of mine in the city. Actually, he wasn't even my friend, but he's a, he's a poet. And he could hear the connection between rap and poetry. And so he came to me and he said, listen, why don't we start putting together some shows called Rap Meets Poetry just for fun? And I said, fine. And I was able to talk to some of my guys and pull them in. And, and that's what you'd hear. And that led to the creation of the label. And, you know, uh, certainly from the very beginning, I agreed with this poet. His name is Bob Holman. I agreed that, um, you know, rap was poetry. So it wasn't a big leap uh, for us to go into business and to do this. And, um, you know, in terms of, you know, something that's, uh, you know, one of my favorites, you know, I'm somebody, you know, I grew up with the last poets listening to their music. And I think that that stuff qualifies as uh, spoken word uh, uh, and as, you know, R&B, you know, it kind of lives in the, uh, in the intersection of those two things. And, you know, you know, Gil Scott Heron and the last poets, you know, a lot of that stuff still means an awful lot to me. Yep, yep. This got, I, I think I got one, one or two of their records that has Oh, the last poet. I got them from my father. My father has this right. big. My my father's a big lost poet fan. I mean, just just to, you know, if you listen to their records, it's it's pretty, got some good stuff. Well, listen, you know, you might have to interview him for your archives, Ernest. Okay. You know, talk, talk to your old man about you know all of his taste. Okay. And about what it what it meant to him. I mean, the last poets. You know, there's no overstating. Uh, you know, kind of the political impact as, as well as the, the musical impact. You know, mm -hmm. they, they were like, you know, uh, the, 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 the Black Panther poets. Yes, really, what they exactly. were the, Yeah, and, and exactly. so, you know, so at one of the same time, they were going to be uh, uh, beautiful wordsmiths, but they're also political as hell. So. Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, there's no other questions, Bill Wilk. We'll continue to stay in touch. We'll, um, you know, I recorded this and we'll get it all nice and fixed up for you so you can get a copy of it. And okay, uh, we'll, st we'll stay in touch. And hopefully if, you know, if you know anybody that we may be able to interview, uh, let us know. I will. And, you know, what occurs to me is I might reach out. I mean, obviously we're doing this you know, uh, virtually. So, you know, the people I'm thinking of could be anywhere. But one of the things that happened is that a lot of my guys, uh, a lot of my New York guys have moved down South. Okay. And, you know, I'm thinking I might, um, I might call some of them and tell them about what you're doing. And that would be an additional connection for the, for you all to talk about. Okay, sure. And we certainly appreciate it. All righty. Uh, yeah. Thanks again. And uh, have enjoy the rest of your, your, your day. Um, or evening. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening.